The next speaker is a Professor Matt Keith from uh, Flensburg University of Applied Sciences. And the title of his talk is Fluid Structure Interaction Under Periodic Forcing. So please. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the introduction. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk in this workshop. Um, I will talk, as the title indicates, on fluid structure interaction under periodic forcing. I'm primarily interested in the damping effect that a fluid has when it interacts with an elastic structure. My starting point is an elastic structure, an elastic plate to be more specific, which I denote by uh, omega. So it's a two-dimensional flat elastic plate, well, flat if there are no forces acting on it. I will uh, be considering um, periodic forcing of this plate. So I will look at um, outer forces that are, are time periodic and I will uh, denote throughout the time period with uh, this capital T letter you see here. Of course, when you uh, um, excite a plate uh, using an outer force, when an outer force acts on the plate, it will deform and uh, the corresponding displacement I will denote uh, by U. Now I will use a plate model, which is probably the most simple model for uh, elastic uh, structures. In the plate model, only the normal displacement in, uh, sorry, only the displacement in normal direction in is, um, uh, is, 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 is part of the equations. So the U that you see here is the scalar equation, uh, sorry, scalar uh, function denoting the displacement in the normal direction. So, cap, so small n is the normal of the flat plate. Okay, and the plate model that I will be using is the classical kirchhoff lewiv uh, plate model. Uh, DTU, uh, DT squared u plus pi Laplacian u is equal to the uh, normal component of the outer force. In the kirchhoff lewiv plate model, only the normal component of the outer force is taken into uh, consideration. And of course, in order to obtain a well-posed problem, I need to impose boundary conditions. And uh, typically when you look at, at the equation of motion, you also introduce some initial values. A few more comments on the model. It's, um, it models an undamped elastic structure. There, are, there is no damping mechanism in this uh, model. So um, periodic forcing uh, can lead to resonance in this structure. I um, have been told uh, many years ago that whenever I work on uh, physical models, I should understand the physics behind the problems. Um, I, so so I, I looked into the physics of the uh, plate models some years ago, and uh, I have to admit, I, I do not, um, I, I never understood uh, really the physics behind it. Now, I believe that's, <laughs> that is not really derived from physical principles. Uh, so this is important uh, to have this context in, in mind when I, when, when, when I later make some some statements concerning uh, the physics of the plate. Um, we have to be careful with the plate equations. Uh, they, are not, they are not derived, as I, I write here, from physical principles. But as a, as, as a, as a, at least as a toy model, it, it's, 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 it's very good. And uh, of course, it's more than a toy model because it's used in, in a, a wide variety of applications. But we have to be a little bit careful. Now, you can obtain the uh, kirchhoff lewiv plate model as a limit from 3D elasticity. Uh, if you consider a plate with some thickness epsilon and you let epsilon 10 to zero, then you can obtain from the 3D elasticity of 
a plate with thickness in the limit as the thickness tends to zero. You can obtain the plate equation. So this is a, a justification. This was shown by CLA and it is Dundier in the 80s. And, um, but they have to make some additional on physical assumptions. So even uh, this result doesn't really justify the plate model. But as I, uh, as I said, it's, it's uh, as, as a, a first model to uh, understand, well, what I want to understand is the, the damping effect of a fluid that interacts with, with an elastic structure and as, um, as a first model to, to understand this phenomenon, the, the kirchhoff lewis plate model um, is quite good, as we will see. Okay, so as I mentioned, there is no damping in the um, uh, plate uh, on the kirchhoff lewis model. So uh, a periodic forcing may lead to the onset of a resonance. And this you can see very easily. Just take some um, eigen uh, function, I call it here V and some corresponding eigenvalue of the bilaplacian, with of course the same boundary conditions as we uh, had before in our, in our uh, plate model. Uh, then you can construct using this eigenfunction and eigenvalue a periodic forcing. I put here an epsilon in front of it in order to <laughs> indicate that it can be very small. Uh, the amplitude can be very small. Uh, but if the, uh, the frequency is such that, uh, well, here given by square root of the eigenvalue, um, and you excite with this, this eigenfrequency on the eigen mode, in this way, you get a resonant solution. What do I mean by resonant solution? It's a solution that has unbounded growth in time. So even though you have a very small periodic forcing, small in the sense of amplitude, if you excite, the eigen frequency on the eigen mode. The solution will be unbounded. You will have resonance. So this is what I mean by, by resonance. Okay, so in general, as I said, periodic forcing on an eigen frequency eigen mode leads to uh, resonance regardless of the amplitude and uh, also regardless of the initial values you may consider. Okay, to characterize the resonance a little uh, in a formal way, uh, you can introduce some autonormal basis of eigenfunctions to the bilaplacian, your uh, series v VK, the corresponding eigenvalues, uh, monotone decreasing, tending to infinity, and introduce the corresponding iconic uh, Fourier transform, but basically just the uh, the, um, the mapping that takes an L2 function and and uh, projects onto the different eigenfunctions that you get. Well, a free like a type transform uh, from L2 to the series of square integral coefficients. Okay, and um, let me also introduce uh, the uh, torus. Uh, corresponding to the time period of the uh, forcing. Okay, and with Ft, you see uh, here is the classical free transform on the uh, torus. So it's an expansion essentially of an L2 function uh, into its free coefficients. Okay, so now I uh, introduce the, the, the product or the composition of my two Fourier transform, one the Fourier transform in space and the Fourier transform in time. I call it this product, call it F, and I get kind of, well, let's call it a kind of a Fourier transform or a spectral calculus uh, in a way uh, like, like this. So, um, If we now consider our plate equation, but uh, in a setting where the time axis has been replaced with the torus uh, T, if we can solve this equation in this, in this torus setting, torus with respect to time, 
then the corresponding solution obviously will live on the torus with respect to time, so it will be time periodic. Okay. Um, solution to this problem here, we uh, obtain by employing our Fourier transform. And, um, well, we at least we obtain a, an equation for, for the uh, solution. Now, we have here a kind of a Fourier symbol. If we can divide by this uh, symbol and imply our inverse Fourier transform, then we have a um, explicit formula for uh, a time periodic solution U. So, uh, well, we have found if this formula is well defined, a, a time periodic uh, solution. So if you can find a time periodic uh, solution, then uh, it's easy to show that, um, in fact, any solution uh, will be uh, time periodic. And the time periodic solution we can find, as I said, if we can invert the symbol here, when, we can, when can we invert the symbol? Well, when it doesn't have any zeros, uh, so if the support of the um, uh, of the outer force uh, is uh, is a set uh, that does not contain any zeros of the symbol, then I can invert uh, or, or solve this equation for the u, and I get a time periodic solution. I then don't get resonance. On the other hand, uh, I get resonance. I can show if the opposite is true if namely the support of the uh, Fourier transform of the outer force coincides with some of the uh, critical um, the values of my uh, Fourier parameters. Here I call them L and K, uh, namely the parameters where my symbol doesn't uh, invert. Okay. So that's a way, basically, I mean, I mean with this uh, characterization here, I'm just saying that uh, that a force, uh, that I get resonance if and only if my outer force excites an eigenmode on an eigenfrequency. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a fancy way of saying exactly that. So nothing new uh, here. Okay. Um, but I like the formalism. I will use it uh, again uh, later. Uh, now let me uh, introduce some damping, because that's essentially what I'm interested in. Um, but what I'm really interested in is a damping coming from a fluid interaction with the structure. But before we start with a complex uh, damping uh, from a fluid, let's look at a simple damping. The term DTU in the plate equation constitutes a simple damping. Right? DTU is the velocity, so um, what you're introducing here is a force proportional to velocity, so it's classical damping. Um, now, if we try to do the same trick as before, look for a, a time periodic solution of the same period as the outer force. Um, we employ our Fourier calculus and obtain, after Fourier transforming the equation, the symbol that you see uh, here, All right? So we have um, now due to the damping, an additional uh, term, uh, the uh, i uh, two pi over t l. So we have an imaginary um, uh, part in our symbol. Now, um, due to this uh, imaginary part, uh, this symbol. It can be uh, inverted because, um, well, uh, if the real part is is uh, zero, so if the L square times uh, two pi over t squared is equal to the uh, eigen value lambda k, well, in this case, in this case, um, the real part is zero, but then the imaginary part is non-zero. Of course, uh, with the exception of 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 L equals to zero, but this uh, one Fourier mode. Um, if we disregard this one Fourier mode, we can invert the symbol. So disregarding this one Fourier mode means that we have to assume that the outer force has a zero, uh, time, uh, zero average over the time. So let's assume that for a moment, then we can invert the symbol and we see that the simple damping uh, means that we immediately get in our spectral calculus, a formula for a time periodic solution 
So uh, regardless of the outer force uh, F, I didn't write it here, but I, I'll say it again. We have to assume out of force that have uh, zero average over over the, the, the period. But for, for any such out of force, uh, we, we find a corresponding time periodic solution. And if you can find a particular solution of your uh, PDE that is time periodic, it's uh, quite easy to show in this simple case linear equation that then all uh, solution, regardless of initial values, are time periodic and uh, you don't have any resonance solution. So even this simple damping here um, prevents the onset of uh, resonance. And the key to, to, to this conclusion is um, that we, we immediately obtain a formula, a well-defined formula for a time periodic solution. Okay, so, um, what uh, happens now if we um, introduce some more complex damping? So now I look at it. some uh, term here, D of U, which, uh, which is, is, is supposed to be some uh, more complicated nonlinear damping uh, mechanism. So for damping, obviously we have D of zero should be zero, but uh, apart from that, I, I don't, uh, uh, want to make any uh, assumption. So this can be some complex mechanism that's supposed to damp your system. Of course, I'm getting at the damping mechanism coming from a fluid interaction, uh, but let's uh, keep it, um, keep this, this uh, damping mechanism abstract at the moment. Okay, so I want to um, introduce the, the, the definition of resonance prevention. So uh, I will say that a damping term uh, is or suffices to prevent resonance if there is an epsilon such that no matter which time periodic force you consider it may be I, I write the norm but of course I don't have any at the moment any any Banach spaces so so uh, we'll take it so, so it's a little bit abstract and and, and um, uh, um, at, at the moment, but but read this. You can you can interpret this norm as sufficient. So so, so it can have small uh, sufficiently uh, small amplitude. But if for any time periodic force you can find a corresponding time periodic solution, then I will say that the damping is sufficient to avoid or to prevent uh, resonance. Because of course, if uh, I can, for any time periodic force, find a, a corresponding time periodic solution, then, uh, well, whatever initial values this time periodic solution has, uh, I will have one, one solution that is not resonant, no matter what frequency I'm, uh, I'm considering. So that certainly is a good measure for, um, to, to, or a good metric to, to say that we, we can prevent, the damping is good enough to prevent the regular concept of resonance. Okay, so um, of course, in order to analyze such a um, uh, problem, or in order to answer such a question, we need to introduce some uh, function uh, spaces and some uh, mathematical formalism. So let's assume that we have some nice Banach spaces and damping mechanism D that maps uh, from an X space here into a Y space. And I'm considering here function spaces uh, where the time axis is the Togo, so I'm in this kind of a time periodic setting. Okay. Um, of course, uh, I can then linearize my uh, nonlinear mapping D around zero and uh, write my uh, nonlinear damping mechanism as the linearized part and a nonlinear part. So if we now look at the plate equation with the linear, linear part of the damping, if the X space and the Y space, our function analytical framework is so good that our uh, operator 
for differential operator and then we get a full operator with time and space. If this operator is a homeomorphism from the X space into the Y space, I call this time periodic maximum regularity because the function space is the X space and the Y space uh, typically will be some Sobolev space or, or similar kind of spaces. So uh, the X space will typically be uh, what we characterize as a maximum regularity space. Of course, in this time periodic setting where the time axis is the tall. So if we have a good um, uh, function analytic framework in which, uh, by good, I mean uh, in which we have here that our uh, differential operator with or a linear operator is a homeomorphism, then we can uh, solve the, um, the, the, the nonlinear problem, uh, the fully nonlinear problem by, uh, by a fixed point argument. So if we can close, if the X space and Y space are so good that we can close a fixed point argument, um, then we get a solution in this time periodic setting when the outer force is sufficiently small. So uh, if we have, and that's the conclusion I want to make here, if we have good time periodic maximum regularity for the operator which includes the linear operator which includes the linear part of the damping, then according to our definition, the damping suffices to prevent uh, resonance. So uh, according to this uh, observation here, there is a connection between um, between uh, uh, the, the, the quality of a damping term and uh, the maximal regularity or the type of, of maximal regularity that you can show for the corresponding linear operator, uh, the linear operator, I mean, of course, the um, or hyperbolic uh, uh, plate equation operator uh, minus the linearized part of the damping term. Okay, so there's a connection between maximal regularity and uh, damping and resonance. Okay, let's look at some examples. So again, the simple damping. If um, we introduce uh, the, the simple damping DTU from before, we uh, immediately get uh, a solution for our time periodic solution. And we can check that uh, in this uh, representation formula, we can take one time derivative and uh, our multiplier here stays bounded. Yeah. Um, of course, uh, it's not, uh, again, why is, it, why is it bounded? Well, if you take a look at the denominator, of course, the real part can be zero, but in the region where the real part is zero, we have uh, L squared is proportional to the, the lambda uh, k. So, um, um, well, actually, for the time derivative, it doesn't matter because I have L here and I have L here. But let me move on to the uh, to uh, the, the space derivative. So, if I take a Laplacian, so my uh, in my spectral calculus, I'm uh, my my spectral calculus is based on eigen functions with respect to the B Laplacian. So a Laplacian is at least morally uh, the same as uh, in the Fourier space or in my spectral uh, um, space uh, equal to the, the square root of, of uh, the lambda of a lambda k. I have not introduced a boundary value, of course, so, so it's, it's taken it with a little bit of a grain of salt uh, here, but this is just to convey an idea at the moment. Anyway, so if you look at the uh, at, at the Laplacian of U in this uh, calculus, well, uh, this is also uh, the corresponding symbol, uh, sorry, corresponding multiplier here is also bounded because uh, when the real part of the denominator, namely the real part here, is zero, well, then the L square is proportional to the lambda k, uh, so L is uh, proportional to uh, square root of uh, lambda k. And uh, of course, in the imaginary part, we have an L, so we can have in the numerator a square root of, of the lambda. So, um, so we can take also Laplacian, but we cannot take any anything more. So in this case, if we stay in an L2 setting where we have a possible um, 
the uh, possible uh, theory and possible uh, equality, then uh, we can uh, identify a maximum regularity space here, X, uh, as a space where we have um, a series of functions uh, that, uh, where, where we have one, can say one derivative with respect to time um, and end up in L2 or uh, two uh, derivatives with respect to. So let's look at some other damping. Yes, um, what is sometimes known as the Kelvin Fock damping, DT Laplacian. We do the same trick. Um, there should be a U here. We uh, look at the equation with the damping. We employ our Fourier transform. We see that our damping has a an imaginary part, so we can invert the symbol and we get a nice representation formula. Now we can start to look at how many derivatives that we can put on the U. Um, and um, we can put, in this case, we can put a square, we can put two, two time derivatives and the multiplier here, in this case, will stay bounded, I claim. Let's see, so if the real part is zero, then um, if we neglect the nuisance factor two pi over, over t, then the L squared is equal to the lambda k. If the L squared is equal to the lambda k, then the square root of lambda is equal to L, and then we have L squared in the uh, denominator, so uh, it's okay to have an L squared also in the numerator. Uh, the symbol stays bounded, and due to possible, we end up again in L2 if the force is in L2. On the same token, we can take uh, you know, two Laplacians in, um, in, in space, and uh, we can do the same kind of analysis and see that we end up in, uh, in, in L2 if the data F is in L2. So in this case of a kelvin fock damping, I should have put here, there should be kelvin fock damping here. In the case of a kelvin fock damping, the maximal regularity space is, uh, is a space of much more regular, uh, regular functions, right? So we have here two derivatives in time, and um, oh, that should have been a, a four here, four derivatives in space with values in L2. Okay, so, Clearly, uh, we have here that the Kelvin Fock damping has, uh, or yeah, the Kelvin Fock damping dt Laplacian leads to better regularity than the simple uh, dt uh, term uh, from before. Uh, and and why? Well, in our analysis, we are simply just uh, utilizing that the symbol in our Fourier calculus here of the Kelvin Fock damping grows much faster than the symbol of the simple damping uh, DT term. So um, what we observe is that the growth of the Fourier symbol in a way quantifies the damping effect of, um, of, of the damping term. Almost to be more precise, if you have a nonlinear damping, then the Fourier uh, symbol of the linearized part of your damping, the growth of this uh, symbol of the linearized part this is what uh, quantifies, uh, in a sense, the damping effect. So uh, why am I telling you this? Because I, I need at some point, or I want to uh, reach a point where I can quantify the damping effect coming from a fluid in a fluid structure interaction problem. And uh, I, I, I think this is a good way of, of measuring the damping effect. Uh, and it's essentially, it's, 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 it's a way of, of um, or it, it's it's you're, you're basically asking how much regularity do does a, a certain damping term uh, give you the better regularity uh, for, for the corresponding linearized uh, operator uh, the more the damping effect because well the more possibility I have to close a fixed point argument and show uh, existence of a time periodic solution which uh, is um, for for any uh, uh, sufficiently small in amplitude right hand side and that was my uh, measure for avoiding uh, resonance or my criteria for avoiding resonance 
So, um, okay, so that's a way to measure a damping effect uh, by using this, this kind of spectral or Fourier uh, calculus. Okay, so now I uh, move on to the real uh, problem that I'm interested in, namely um, the damping effect coming from the interaction with a viscous fluid. So now we consider our elastic plate uh, on the top of a reservoir of uh, viscous fluid. And we consider still a periodic forcing. And, and now we try to investigate, to understand, to quantify the damping effect of the fluid. We have a fluid structure uh, problem here, uh, and it's a free boundary problem. Uh, at least I want to treat it as, as such. Um, as, uh, which, uh, of course, gives you some challenges when you uh, try to analyze it. It's a coupling of a hyperbolic part, our plate equation, with a parabolic part. Uh, I will use the Navier-Stokes equations to model the fluid, the viscous fluid, so I have a hyperbolic-parabolic coupling. That is also, uh, in many ways, a challenge, of course, um, in terms of, of uh, energy. Um, it's important that I have energy dissipation in the parabolic part. So this is the damping effect. So I have, a, yeah, if, if I have a way mechanism with which my energy can dissipate, I have damping in my system. So this energy dissipation in the, in the fluid is the damping effect. And now I want to try and understand it, to quantify it, to measure it, if you like. Okay, and of course, uh, the question ultimately I want to answer is if this damping of effect of the viscous fluid, is it sufficient to prevent the occurrence of resonance in the plate? From probably from a physical point of view, you say, sure, I mean, I have the this dissipation, energy dissipation in the viscous part, so clearly this kind of mechanism will prevent the damping uh, in the plate, because as you saw before, even a simple damping mechanism, DTU term, prevents a resonance, so why shouldn't a fluid, a fluid I'm sure, would also prevent the resonance from a physical point of view, but from a mathematical point of view, you need to show, or at least I want to show this uh, rigorously. Uh, and that's the goal. Okay, and of course, as I already said, also to quantify, to measure the damping effect of the viscous fluid. Okay, so let's uh, start um, uh, looking at, at the equations of motion. So our uh, container uh, filled with uh, fluid, I call omega. And of course, uh, it's a free boundary problem. The, uh, the uh, state of the plate, the deformation of the plate is an unknown given by the displacement uh, u. So my container, I call it u of t. And uh, well, it's given by the expression, right? So um, it's a cuboid. It's a cuboid with uh, the x3 component. Uh, denoting the, 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 the normal uh, direction of our container. Okay, so uh, for the fluid, I use uh, Navier-Stokes to model the uh, equations of motion. Uh, yeah, so the T you see here is the Cauchy stress tensor of um, a Navier-Stokes fluid. Incompressible divergence uh, is equal to zero. Okay, so um, how, which, which coupling do we have uh, between the fluid and the structure? We have one coupling condition, uh, which uh, you, that you see, the, the one you see here. This is a no-slip uh, boundary condition essentially for the fluid. It states that the velocity at the, uh, is for a, of a fluid particle at the uh, boundary, at the elastic boundary or the plate boundary uh, is equal to the velocity of the boundary. Remember, we in the plane model, we only have a displacement in normal direction. So what you see here in yellow is the velocity on the plate. So uh, we have adherence, no slip boundary condition here on the fluid uh, structure surface. Then of course, we also have a coupling in the, the plate equation. Uh, the plate equation, which is our 
uh, equation of motion for the plate. The right hand side uh, of the plate equation, uh, we have the forces acting on the plate. We have our outer force, the periodic F. By the way, now FPER is a um, is a scalar, so I don't have to project it onto the normal direction the whole time. Before, when I introduced it, it was a vector, but from now on, it's a scalar. And then we have, of course, the force coming from the uh, motion of the fluid. So, uh, what you see here in red is uh, well, it's the force that comes from the fluid, but it's at the same time, of course, also uh, or damping effect, right? So it's, it's what we need to, to, to analyze, at least to understand the damping effect of the fluid. Okay, I need to put also, in order to get well persistent, additional boundary conditions. And uh, I will uh, return to the boundary conditions a little bit later. Okay, so now um, we ask the question, if the damping from the fluid, which in mathematical terms is uh, described by this force term here, is this damping from the fluid sufficient to prevent a resonance in the plate? Uh, perhaps just very uh, briefly on, on this damping term. So we have here the stress tensor, Cauchy stress tensor. Then we have here times capital N. Capital N is the uh, normal in the uh, current uh, configuration of, of the plate. Uh, and this force you project onto the normal component because in the plate model, in, in you only take normal component, a normal component, I mean, uh, normal of the reference configuration, small n. Okay, so this is this classical uh, way of introducing or describing in the plate model or introducing into the plate model the, the, the force coming from the fluid. Okay, and this we have to now analyze to understand in to understand the damping effect that lies behind this uh, term here. Okay, so uh, yeah, so now the abstract damping mechanism that I called du from before uh, now has uh, is, is is from now on uh, a specific uh, term uh, given by well essentially given in terms of a solution v uh, p to the Navier-Stokes equations. But of course, uh, the solution to the Navier-Stokes equation, the only input you have in the Navier-Stokes equation is the, uh, the data uh, coming from the, um, the motion of the plate, so the U. So you can interpret the, or you can view the solution to the Navier-Stokes equation as a function of U. So at the end of the day, you have a, a damping effect that you can view as a function of U. Uh, use the formalism I introduced before to analyze it. Okay, <clears throat> so now I start with a um, rigorous uh, analysis of the um, of this fluid plate uh, system. I introduced, to be honest, I cannot see. I just take me just a second. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I wrote here damped plate. I suspect, suspect it as much. Uh, I will now um, uh, rigorously, as the first step, analyze uh, the fluid uh, structure equations with, a, with, with an additional damping mechanism in the plate. So essentially, I will be cheating here uh, to begin with. Uh, there's a reason for that, and I will explain in a minute why. Okay, but the elastic plate, I will look at the most simple uh, of geometries, namely the elastic plate being just a square. So, how oh, my computer works again? Very good. Okay, so um, uh, we have a container uh, filled with uh, fluid as uh, before, and we have the Navier Stokes equation uh, for the fluid in the container. We have the no slip cobbling condition uh, of velocities on the fluid structure interface. And uh, we now look at the um, elastic uh, plate equation or the plate equations with an additional uh, internal damping term. This, this is the Kelvin-Vogt uh, damping term from before. And of course, this is cheating 
uh, on my part, uh, I'm introducing, in addition to the damping, the red damping that uh, from the fluid, I introduce also an internal damping in the structure. Um, so, uh, but there's a reason for this, and the reason is that um, I need the additional regularity to begin with, or at least uh, it becomes very difficult if I don't have the regularity. In my later talks on, on uh, uh, Thursday and Friday, I will talk about what happens if you if you remove this uh, internal uh, damping mechanism here in blue, the Kevin Folk uh, term. Um, of course, the goal is to to remove it, but for now, just to uh, just just to to figure out how to analyze uh, the problem, we we introduce the term. So again, I will explain you during my analysis why the term is is, is important um, to begin with, at least, and uh, at least why <laughs> why I need to cheat at this point. Okay, so of course, uh, I need additional boundary conditions on uh, the. Um, on the lateral faces and on the bottom of my container. I will introduce those in a moment. And um, yeah, okay. So um, these are the equations of motion I will be looking at. Um, I will introduce periodic boundary conditions. So this is actually also a way of cheating because periodic boundary condition, when I say periodic boundary condition at this point, I mean periodic with respect to the, um, uh, to the to two spatial directions. Now, periodic boundary condition in this kind of, of, of setting here is, is, is so in my view, very unphysical. So again, I'm unfortunately uh, moving a little bit away from the physically uh, uh, reasonable scenario, uh, but this is the easiest way to, to analyze the problem, to, to look at the boundary condition. So as a first step, as a toy model, if you like, we take my periodic boundary conditions. It's very difficult to get rid of them, by the way. I will return to this question later. So what does periodic boundary condition mean in our model? This means here that I assume that in the x1 direction, uh, I am uh, um, my data and solution are periodic in space and also in the x2 direction. On the um, bottom face of my container, I take a no-slip boundary condition. Okay. So, and also for the um, uh, for the plane equation for my displacement uh, u, I consider uh, these kind of periodic uh, boundary conditions with respect to, to space. Now, in order to get a well-posed uh, system when you have periodic boundary condition, you typically also need to introduce uh, a, a average condition, this average condition uh, coincides with the volume condition that you need anyway, because uh, the divergence is zero. I put it here in my system of equations to solve. Okay, so uh, in the beginning, I already uh, played with the idea of introducing a Tori to um, impose, in order to impose a variadic boundary condition. I did that before in time. Now I do it in space. So the periodic boundary condition uh, are imposed by simply uh, choosing as the spatial domain uh, this uh, torus uh, squared, right? Um, now, if I change my, my I'm basically I'm changing my geometry here, but a very simple <laughs> change of geometry. Uh, in this new ge geometry on, 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 on the, not torus, I will consider my system of PDE. Now, if you come from differential geometry, this is very easy. Uh, this torus is a smooth manifold, so you can consider your equations on the smooth manifold. But you don't, of course, because it's so simple, the geometry, this torus <laughs> setting here, you don't need differential geometry. Uh, you can, uh, you can um, simply use the, the quotient mapping as a, as, a, as a kind of a pullback mapping, if you like, and by the via the quotient mapping, transfer uh, the differential structure of the torus to uh, to the classical functional setting here. So, um, in this sense that I write here, I now uh, rewrite my equations of motion uh, on the uh, 
on, on this um, with the spatial domain replaced by the torus T naught or T naught squared. So instead of a disk, I have T naught squared. And uh, in this case, I don't need to impose any uh, periodic boundary conditions because they are automatically satisfied when I solve in a function analytical framework where all functions are defined on this torus, then everything data solution, everything is perfect in space as I wanted it to be. So uh, we look at this system here. Okay, again, uh, I don't like these periodic boundary conditions, but in order to uh, understand the mathematics as a first uh, step, I, uh, I, I, I consider them. Okay, um, because I want to understand uh, when I can get time periodic solutions for small data, that's my criteria for avoiding resonance. Uh, I um, also replace the time axis with the torus and um, corresponding to the period of my uh, out of loss. And then I have uh, my, my full system of equation here in the final setting in which I want to consider uh, these equations. So I have a torus in time and I have a torus, so here again torus in time and a torus in space. And that's, that's the setting. Okay, at the Navier-Stokes equation here, I have a boundary condition for the velocity field of the Navier-Stokes equation, and I have my um, Clade equation for the displacement u, and I have an uh, error condition here. Okay, so uh, in order to analyze the system, I want to treat it as, a, as, a, as the free boundary pro problem that it is. So in order to uh, to analyze the system, the first thing we have to do is to um, reformulate these, this system in a, a reference configuration. So, of course, as a reference configuration, I choose the uh, container uh, with an uh, undeformed plate. Uh, the current configuration is, uh, of course, the uh, configuration from the equations of motion with the deformed plate. And now we need uh, to construct a mapping, I call it here phi u, which maps in a nice way the reference configuration into the current configuration. Uh, certainly it has to be bijective, but it also has to have certain amount of smoothness in order for our analysis to be, um, to, to, in order for us to perform a good analysis. So we need to find such a mapping. Um, usually in, in uh, I'm not the first one to consider this type of problem, of course, and many authors, I will uh, at the end of my talks series give you some references, but uh, I'm not the first. And, and often you see uh, in, in, in the papers on this uh, kind of uh, subject here, you see uh, the choice of uh, what I call ref to curve mapping. So the mapping between reference and current configuration. You see this choice here because it's a natural choice, right? You know the deformation u on the uh, of the plate, so you simply extend u by this uh, this simple uh, mechanism here into the bulk, and then you um, then you have a mapping which does exactly what you want to do. Uh, if u is small, this is bijective, and well, it looks good. In fact, it's not that good of a choice um, because you lose regularity or at least you can find a better kind of uh, you can find a better mapping with better regularity uh, if you are in a say setting of of uh, Sobolev spaces where you have a trace operator well if you have a trace operator you also have an extension operator so a, a right inverse of um, uh, uh, of of your uh, trace operator um, uh, no, left inwards. And uh, the extension operator uh, gives you uh, the regularity, <laughs> the additional regularity that you lose when you uh, employ a trace uh, operator. So, uh, you know, when you take a trace, you lose regularity. If you use the corresponding extension operator, you gain regularity. And, and this can be a good source of additional regularity in your analysis if you, instead of this choice of uh, mapping, use this choice of mapping between the reference and the current configuration. I will return to this point uh, later also. 
Okay, so um, now we uh, introduce some new coordinates uh, by simply using the, the phi function, the mapping between reference and current configuration to, um, to pull back everything into the reference configuration. So we uh, express the velocity field in the reference uh, configuration coordinates and also the pressure fields. Then, of course, everything gets very messy. You get a lot of garbage terms and um, yeah, I, it looks like this. Well, this is one way of, of writing it. If you choose the simple phi uh, from before, it, it's, it's much simpler. You get much, uh, you, you, you don't have so many terms, um, but for the sake of, of, um, uh, of <laughs> you can also use the, 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 uh, the more sophisticated, uh, Mapping phi, I, I use, I, I wrote here the, the general case. Okay. Um, yeah, um, I can't, I don't want to really uh, say too much about, I mean, you get garbage terms, it's basically a chain rule everywhere, right? And you produce a lot of garbage terms. You can use the Paola identity to write uh, some of the terms in a nice way. For example, here, the um, divergence of the stress tensor in the new coordinates. Uh, you pay a price with the cofactor matrix of the divergence condition. You can you can write nicely with the Piola uh, identity if you're familiar with the Piola identity. Um, okay, so it's highly nonlinear, of course, lots of garbage terms. The first thing I do now is I uh, linearize. Okay, so um, if you uh, if you uh, recall the phi function, the way it was constructed, we can always write it as uh, in, in, even in the most common, in, even in the sophisticated, uh, for, the, for the sophisticated choice as the identity plus uh, something uh, that uh, depends linearly on, on you. And so the gradient is the identity matrix plus the gradient of something that depends linearly on you. So if you uh, now insert uh, this, this expression for phi and gradient phi in the uh, equations from, from before and isolate every other terms of higher order on the right hand side uh, and uh, keep all the linear stuff on the left hand side you get this um, say linearized equation of motion that you see here so you have uh, the Stokes equation you have uh, of course the boundary values and you have the plate equation the plate equation at the whole time was written in Lagrangian uh, coordinates so uh, so that you don't feel the change of coordinates Okay, we have uh, now, of course, a right hand side here F1 and F2, um, and also the right hand side from the with a force, uh, which has a lot of higher order uh, garbage terms. Interestingly, uh, the only linear term that remains after uh, linearizing uh, in this way in the, in, in the fluid uh, force. On the right hand side, and I'll put this linear term, of course, on the left hand side. After linearizing the uh, damping term from the fluid, the force coming from the fluid, only a uh, this pressure term here remains. That is the only uh, linear part of the um, uh, of the of the fluid force. All the rest uh, is is also of high order. Okay, so now it looks uh, more manageable. Let me just get the time, a couple of minutes, and then I will, um, uh, I will stop. Okay, so um, now I, um, I, will, uh, yeah, I will carry out here a decomposition. So if you just look at the system here again, so I now uh, take this uh, right-hand side F1 and F2 in the Stokes equation and consider uh, just, uh, uh, I consider a splitting of my velocity field V into a C. W and the C, uh, I, I choose as the solution to this Stokes problem here, where I put the non homogeneous right hand side in the uh, mass and momentum conservation equation for the fluid. Okay, and then um, the rest I connect uh, in another uh, system of equations that I call fluid structure interaction. Okay, so. Um, here the same system uh, again what you we see and this is the last observation that i will uh, uh, make today is that the um that after doing the splitting here 
we have now two pressures, right? One pressure up here in the uh, Stokes part with non-homogeneous uh, right-hand side and one pressure in the uh, remaining uh, Stokes part, which has uh, the, where you have the cobbling condition. Okay, so uh, if you look at the two Stokes equations, you see that the, that the dependency in this Stokes system down here on the U is linear. Just have this linear term here. So this means that the pressure pi from this uh, from the Stokes system in the FSI equation, this pressure depends linearly on the U. Whereas the other pressure up here, uh, what I feel here, the calligraphic P, this depends non-linearly on on the uh, on 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 U because it's uh, yeah well it's the right hand side here. Uh, are just higher order term, a higher order term. So it's 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 a nonlinear it's a nonlinear function of u, essentially. So what I have uh, done here by this uh, composition is I have uh, identified the linearization of the fluid damping. So the fluid damping was given uh, by this term here. So the the force exerted by the fluid on the elastic plate, the normal component of this force. Highly nonlinear. Now we have identified the linear part and the rest, the rest nonlinear part. And the linear part is just this pressure coming from this Stokes equation here. And the rest here is a nonlinear part. Okay, so now I can uh, round up my talk for today because now I know which uh, equations I need to understand. Now I have the linearization of the damping from the fluid, the L. Um, so I consider now. Uh, Consider first and foremost the plate equation where I have just the linear part of my damping mechanism, which is the pi. So, of course, I have the pressure coming from this linear Stokes system. This is the linear part uh, that I need to understand um, when I understand exactly which damping effect this pressure term has. In this equation here, I know. Uh, but which I know the, the I know the effect of 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 that I'm after, namely the effect or that the fluid has the damping effect the fluid has on my elastic plate. But I need, of course, now to understand this this uh, yeah this term here. How what is of course it's a function of of pi essentially, yeah. It's a function of u, but I know we know we, I need to know which function and how to determine. Uh, the regularizing effect of this, this damping term. Okay, so um, of course the answer uh, for um, when we talk about uh, damping effects, uh, we give in terms of a regularity. And here I have a, a, a maximal regularity space that I identified as the space that is uh, that is the canonical space corresponding to this damping effect. Okay, but uh, I see that my time is up, so I will uh, I will uh, stop here and uh, and continue with the proof of this theorem in my next talk. So uh, that's it for me from today. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much for your nice talk. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Yeah, yes. One one is a very trivial question to you. When small n is, I I forget. Sorry, I may be missing your stay, saying about n. Small n, n is which direction? I understand um, capital n, but small n. The the small n was the uh, normal uh, of the in the reference configuration. Let me go back. Sorry, I yeah. put this in. Oops. Yeah. This is the no this is just the normal of the flat plate. So zero zero one. Right. Zero zero one. Zero zero one. So this was I, yeah, oh, zero, zero, one. So, only uh, <laughs> it was okay. only here on the first plate. Yeah, sorry, I should have been more careful about this. So it's zero zero one and the capital N mm -hmm. is the 
uh, is the normal on the default on the deform plate. So the capital so in B. force is only on, on, force on the boundary to the uh, uh, fluid is only this in a small inner direction. Uh -huh. Small in direction, yes. Um, okay. And if you ask me about the physics about this, I don't. I, it's strange, uh, but this is the way. Uh, um, because you in the plate model only the f the component of the force in this uh, small in direction is taken into account. But so you uh, consider uh, this right this about stress wondering stress about it because you the, the uh, stress uh, on the boundary displacement of you. You is a displacement. Of, of, uh, yeah, in so you is the dis dis displacement of the. Uh, yeah. Okay. Of okay. The plate. No, it's okay. And then the second question is, uh, do you consider uh, the uh, the case where d t r plus u? Uh, I don't I don't remember the name of the equation, but uh, that case is that you get uh, exponential decay. So you can treat this equation as in the LQ. Yes, and, and that's d t r plus u. Yeah, it seems to be more it seems to be more parabolic equation. So yeah, so you're absolutely right. So this oh, yes. is is is, is cheating on a very high level because in essentially when I introduce this damping term, I completely uh, parabol. I, I I obtain a system that is essentially parabolic, so I kill the the hyperbolic effect. So, um, yes, I'm um, I'm uh, that is cheating. Um, the thing is, and this I will uh, talk more about ne next 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 time. If you don't introduce this term, um, well, if you don't introduce any additional damping, you don't get uh, LQ, maximal LQ regularity. If you introduce this damping, you get maximal uh, LQ regularity. So there is somewhere in between yeah. <laughs> where the LQ, maximal LQ regularity yeah. uh, is uh, uh, disappears. And um, so in order to, to, to find two polar to treat two polar system one where i have extremely good damping which regularizes everything turns it into uh, as you pointed out a parabolic system exponential decay if you look at the demo. Mm. and okay. then later i will look at the system without any damping and then compare mm. the two so uh, for the moment it's 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 really it's, it, well it is cheating not for the moment. okay okay right. thank you thank you all right Understood. Uh, okay. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, so, uh, Dr. Oishi, please. Uh, here, we consider the omega, the case square, right? So, can we treat other omega? Uh, the omega you, you talk about the yeah the uh, plate equation uh, the sorry I should have a picture somewhere so you here we have the omega right um, <clears throat> at the moment um, I'm uh, I don't know how to do other uh, omegas uh, in the analysis uh, at least um, th the thing is I I introduced the periodic boundary condition in the two spatial direction so I need this this square. Um, it's 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 extremely it's a good question. It is one of the uh, things I really would like to understand how to extend my analysis to more complicated geometries. Because uh, uh, as you observed, this is really too simple to uh, uh, you want more complicated geometries. Okay. I don't know. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Uh, so if not the case, uh, let's thank the speaker again.